This museum is like a fairy tale, like a dream, but a dream was real. During the first year, the Heavy Gordon Museum have expanded greatly and it now contains practically most different kind of art. We are very proud and happy of our beautiful museum. And we hope that you will enjoy it just as much as we do. <laughs> On its bit of land, the art center is a cosmos in itself. A threshold to a new age as reflected in contemporary art. Here, man can contemplate the past, admire the creations of the present, and obtain a glimpse of the future. Did you get it? when you grow up? Oh, yes, Miss Heaney, just like you. You know, I was just your age when I started skating. When I was a little girl, my papa said to me, fly and I, fly and I, fancy and free. As you pirouette and whirl, a lovely world you'll see. So my advice, fly, Always will be. Fly like a bird, be as free as the air, and joy is the word that you'll soon come to share. I've learned what a precious pearl my papa gave to me. Fly a nice, fly a nice, fancy and free. So I tell each boy and girl how happy they can be. If they find your life, find your life, fancy and free. Fancy and free, like, like me. <laughs> I'm going to get Freddie to propose to me. Oh, that's a cinch. Well, I can give you all the answers. I'd better warn you. It never works for me. However, look, here's one approach. Now, the first thing you do, you find a nice, quiet place, you know, romantic-like, with moonlight and everything, and then you make a sad face. Like this? No, 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 I said sad, not mad. Ah, that's better. Then he'll say to you, why, darling, what's the matter? And you'll say, I'm lonely. I'm wretchedly lonely, but nobody cares. Yes, and then? And then you begin to cry a little bit. He'll weaken, take you in his arms and kiss you. And the next thing you know, rice and old shoes. No, I don't want to work. Not with me and Freddy. Why not? We're both too stubborn. I'll show you what I mean. If he came in here right now, he'll say, Hello, Nora. And I'll say, So you finally tore yourself away from that woman. And he'll say, Whatever I do is none of your business. 
and that will make me mad. And then I'll say, if that's the way you feel about it, you don't have to see me anymore. And he'll say something, and I'll say something, and he'll say something, and that will get me mad. And if I get mad, I lose my temper. And if I lose my temper, I get my hand up like this, that's and I get... Laura. Hey, what is this? That's love, pretty. Well, it's a fine way of showing it. Hey! Brad! Oh, Brad! Before Oksana, before Christy, there was Sonia. In the 1930s and 40s, she was queen of the ice. Sonia Henney was the first superstar of the figure skating world. But today, she's usually remembered for the Hollywood movies she starred in. Sonia was, first and foremost, a formidable athlete and competitor. Amazingly, after 61 years, no one has matched her record 10 world championships and three Olympic gold medals. But she also had a great love of money and what money could buy. So early in her life, the money trail led her from the skating world of Oslo to Hollywood, where she lived for years in grand style. Incredible jewels, luxury homes, expensive clothes, and expensive husbands. Sonia seemed to have it all, but it was only later in life that she found true happiness and true love. to skate at home she was a pint-sized package of ability and ambition the first woman ever to win three consecutive olympic gold medals and 10 consecutive world figure skating championships sonia still is the ice skater 
the most famous of all that everyone wants to be. And when Norway's most famous export took her unique skating style to Hollywood, once again she struck gold, this time at the box office. But Sonia Henney was more than a successful skating star. Her insatiable hunger for success earned her a reputation as one of the toughest personalities in Hollywood and made her one of the five wealthiest women in America. Whatever Sonia Henney turned out to be, she did it the hard way. She paid her dues. Sonia Henney was born on April 8, 1912, in Oslo, Norway, to a small but affluent family that included her mother, Selma, and her older brother, Leif. Her father, Wilhelm, was a former two-time world champion bicyclist. An income from his fur business kept the family wealthy. So wealthy, in fact, that Wilhelm was the first man in town to own an automobile and a private airplane. It was Papa Henny's notoriety and fondness for money that would have a tremendous influence on young Sonia. She was taught as a child that money was everything. Money could buy you what you needed and money was a substitute for any close personal attachment. Almost as soon as she could walk, Sonia was taught how to ice skate by her older brother, Life. As kid sisters often do, she would tag along with him on skating outings and desperately try to catch up. Day after day, she got better, stronger, and faster. So much so that by the age of five, she won her first skating competition. Soon, her brother's amateur instruction was replaced with private skating and dance lessons. Years of practice and determination began to pay off. In 1921, at the Norwegian Nationals, nine-year-old Sonja delighted the crowds at Frogner Stadium and became the ice skating champion of Norway. There's always this discussion, are champions born or are they made? And I think there's a little bit of both. You know, I think there are some personalities that are just driven to do whatever and can do it in that do-or-die situation. Spurred on by the victory, the Hennies invested considerable time and money to develop their daughter's talents on a full-time basis. In 1924, Sonia competed in her first Olympic Games, held at Chamonix, France, and she placed an impressive eighth. But losing was a new experience for Sonia, one the 12-year-old was determined never to repeat. Returning home, she began practicing and strategizing for the next Olympics. Formal schoolwork took second place to skating lessons, and socializing was, for the most part, confined to just the immediate family. Almost from the start, when Sonia got her skates and they discovered that she had this great talent and ambition, and uh, ability, she became the focus of the family. Papa Henny oversaw Sonia's training, while Mama Henny focused on her daughter's wardrobe and diet. Her father was a motivational person in her life. The father uh, really encouraged her to become the champion that she was, and gave her that motivation, that driving power. At 15, Sonia became the youngest person ever to win the World Figure Skating Championships. The Olympics were just within her grasp. Held in San Moritz, France, the 1928 Winter Games offered Sonia her second chance at a medal. The young Norwegian mesmerized the audience with her trademark moves and lavish costumes. She said, I come from the land of snow, Norway, so I think my skates should reflect that. They should be white, like the snow. So she had a pair of white skates made. That had never been done before. All the women were wearing black or brown skates, like the men. Rather than, than having the long skirts to the knees, where the skirts were very long and you know, very prim and proper, but Sonia's were, were quite short, and she kept that. And absolutely, that was her trademark. She did it because she wanted to be able to do something more athletic. She wanted to lift her leg up and, and throw it up in the air and do a jump. And, that was what she brought to skating, was a completely new concept of, of freestyle. She did things that women just weren't supposed to do. 
At the tender age of 16, Sonia Henney won the gold medal and became an international skating star. For the next four years, Sonia's life would be a whirlwind of amateur competitions and skating exhibitions. And as her popularity grew, Papa Henney saw to it that his daughter's efforts did not go unrewarded. He was very cagey and crafty, and knowing what the rules and bounds of the Olympics and other world championships were as far as amateurs, he made sure that things were given as gifts rather than as payment. So it was all right for her to accept cars, to accept furs, jewelry, to accept living uh, conditions or living situations. In 1930, Sonia made her first trip to the United States, there to compete in the World Figure Skating Championships. After winning, for the fourth year in a row, she was invited to perform in an ice spectacle for the New York Skating Club. And her name alone drew 16,000 cheering fans to a sold-out Madison Square Garden. Hello, everybody. This is my first visit to you wonderful America. I, sh I am so happy to be here. I know I should hate to live. I want to thank the America people for their splendid reception. Seen here is a rare newsreel clip of Sonia that was distributed to theaters across the country. For many, it was their first glance at skating's number one superstar. In 1932 Olympic Games in Lake Placid, New York, Sonia again won the gold. For the next four years, she continued training and winning hearts as a series of popular personal appearances. Her skating style was so graceful and so lyrical and lovely, and she just really had the perfect balance of being an athlete and being um, just a nymph. I mean, just beautiful. But it was at the 1936 Winter Games, held in Germany, that Sonia's skating would be upstaged by the country's new chancellor, Adolf Hitler. Everything at the 1936 Olympic was geared to show off the Nazi party and the power of Hitler and his force. And so he turned the whole exhibition into a display of everyone paying obeisance to Hitler. Under intense political as well as competitive pressure, many of the athletes saluted Hitler at the beginning and at the end of their routines. Sonia was among those who complied. Sonia gave the uh, salute to Hitler and to the Germans in the stands. And that, and years later, would cause a lot of grief for her. At 24 years of age, Sonia Henney easily captured her third gold medal and added it to her collection of 10 consecutive World Figure Skating Championships. She was now firmly established as one of the best female figure skaters in history. But Sonia wasn't content to rest on her already impressive laurels. She craved the kind of fame, wealth, and attention that was afforded to movie stars and entertainers. Shedding her amateur status, she boarded the Ile de France bound for New York and set her sights on a new life on the silver screen. In 
March of 1936, Sonia Henney, accompanied by her parents, arrived in New York where she was greeted by hordes of reporters. Adorned with diamond jewelry, a mink coat, and an orchid corsage, the Olympic skating star had long since learned how to make a grand entrance. Within weeks, she was booked into a series of highly publicized and highly lucrative personal appearances. Appearances which brought her to the attention of real estate mogul and Blackhawks hockey team owner, Arthur Wirtz. So Sonia used to come and skate at the intermissions of the, of the hockey games, the two intermissions. And Wirtz uh, jokingly said to Sonia, you know, you're ruining my concession business because everyone is staying in the arena to watch you during the breaks in the hockey game. And she said, well, that's because you should have me for the whole evening. And uh, I'll do the whole show. You don't need any hockey. And uh, he said, well, I'll give it a try. The two quickly formed a partnership, with Sonia receiving $70,000 up front, plus a percentage of the gate. It was her first professional tour, and it was a smashing success. But Sonia was still determined to make her mark in Hollywood. She often declared, I want to do with skates what Fred Astaire is doing with dance. Her father in particular, and she secondarily, decided that for whatever reason, 20th Century Fox was the studio where she could be best showcased. They were doing a lot of musicals. Uh, they knew that Daryl Zanuck, the head of the studio, favored blondes. He had this obsession with them. In a calculated effort to attract the attention of Fox's resident boy genius, Papa Henny staged a Sonia Henny ice show, renting Hollywood's Polar Palace for the considerable sum of $28,000. The show, which ran for three nights, was very, very successful and she invited a lot of the top producers and directors. And the second night, Daryl Zanuck came. He was duly impressed by her. Daryl Zanuck offered her a spot in one of his musicals. You know, the musicals were big in those days. And he offered Sonia a skating number in one of his musicals. She walked out of the office. She wouldn't talk to him. She said, it's me all the way or nothing. He said, we'll pay you $10,000. She said, no, I want 75,000. In just two short months, Papa Henny's invasion of Hollywood had resulted in an unprecedented financial victory for his daughter. On May 27, 1936, Sonia signed a five-year movie contract. Included were such perks as a limit to the number of hours she was required to work, time off to continue her ice shows, and a bonus of $7,000 a day for skating sequences. Penny, it is indeed a pleasure to know that you have accepted this contract to star in 20th Century Fox Pictures, and I have every reason to believe that you will achieve on the screen the same international success that has made you the greatest ice skater and the most popular young lady in the world of sport. Thank you, Mr. Static. I shall do my best. Fine. A girl loves a movie contract better than winning an Olympic event. Isn't it so, Sonia? Star of the ice and of the screen. For her all-important first film, One in a Million, Zanuck surrounded his new star with a galaxy of established personalities, like Don Amici, Adolf Manjou, Gene Herschel, and the Ritz brothers. And so he concocted a story that would be partly autobiographical, and they set into a European setting, so her accent was fine. Uh, you know, in America, the uh, boy generally puts his arm around the girl when they go sleigh riding. They do that in Switzerland, too. Zanuck also employed the use of four cameras to simultaneously capture Sonia's famous freestyle moves. One in a Million opened on December 31st, 1936, and became the number one film of the holiday season, earning more than $2 million at the box office. Within a year after winning her third Olympic gold medal, Sonia Henney had become a full-fledged Hollywood star and the object of interest among the town's most eligible bachelors. Well, she had an eye for the guys. <laughs> 
That little turned up nose and those dimples worked pretty good. And she was so little and so cute. Men just uh, adored her. She had a lot of wonderful guys. But I think the, the, the one that she, she liked the most at that time that she was dating was uh, Tyrone Power, who, of course, was the handsomest guy I ever saw in my life. They were seen everywhere. They went to premieres together. The studio said, oh, this is good publicity because it shows that she's dating a wholesome American person. It's building up Tyrone's career to be seen with her. Sonia Henney and Tyrone Power, just before the opening of Hollywood's latest triumph. While Fox prepped Sonia's next film, she and partner Arthur Wirtz planned an event of their own. Combining theatrical lighting, a live orchestra, lavish costumes, and an ensemble of supporting skaters, the creative duo produced the first ever theatrical ice show, elevating what had been a sporting event into an art form and a cash cow. Enter upon the frozen stage of Hollywood's Polar Palace, Sonia Haney, the world's queen of the ice, who steps from the silver screen of 20th Century Fox to inaugurate her transcontinental tour as leading lady of the Hollywood Ice Review. Olympic champion and 10 times the world's top ranking figure skater, she still symbolizes the skillful grace and poetic poise that brought her universal fame. For Henny's next picture, Thin Ice, Zanuck had an innovative indoor ice rink built, especially for his newest star. He also planned to re-team her with Don Amici. But when Henny brought production to a halt by insisting that Tyrone Power be cast as her leading man, Zanuck, once again, conceded. You've given me something, Lily. A new feeling about everything. I'm glad, Trudy. Uh, Lily. Yes? You know that I love you, don't you? Yes. But while filming Thin Ice, Sonia received the news that her beloved Papa Henny, her staunchest defender and ally, had died suddenly of a blood clot. It was a tragedy that even she was powerless to control. Finding comfort in the arms of her handsome co-star, Sonia finished the picture. In July of 1937, having left Norway only 16 months before, Sonia and her mother Selma returned home to Oslo with Wilhelm's ashes. But neither was prepared for the overwhelming reception they received when they arrived home. At Oslo in her native Norway, a festive boat takes the Queen of the Ice to receive the greeting of 60,000 admirers. The 20th Century Fox star gets a triumphal welcome home. Back in the United States, Thin Ice was a runaway success and Sonia's eventual return to Hollywood was no less triumphant than her reception in Norway. She puts on skates to make a footprint. Logically, because she's Sonia Henney, skating champion and film star at Sid Grauman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood, where celebrities of the screen leave their footprints on the cement sidewalk. Also, her signature and good luck in the native Norwegian of the Queen of the Ice and film. Sonia Henney and her mother, the Norwegian minister, and his wife. And the 20th Century Fox star is decorated with the Order of St. Olaf. Queen of the ice and of motion pictures, she receives high honor from her native land. Sonia's next two films firmly established the successful Henney formula. Stories that highlighted the star's physical appeal and concealed her lack of formal training as an actress. This is indeed a great pleasure, Miss Nielsen. But I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you. Oh, Miss Nielsen, say hello to Mr. Taylor. How do you do, Mr. Taylor? Oh, now and then I do all right. This is one of the times. Zanuck was crafty, having been a screenwriter to start with, that he knew how to engineer her pictures so that if you look at her movies, very often, she's not in that much of it. She's a side light of the film, but you think that she's a star because she does a skating sequence where she is the star, and she's in the center of attention when people are talking to her, about her, or with her, but she's really not saying and doing that much. And so for her first three or four movies, 
She was really a subordinate player with star billing. Chris, you were great. You can't walk out on us now. You've got to stay. We need you. Listen, everybody. Chris wants to leave us. Are we going to let her go or not? No! Now are you convinced? I'll stay. <laughs> By the end of 1938, Sonia Henney placed third on the Motion Picture Herald's survey of top moneymakers. And her ICE review was earning a cool $2 million a year. With the help of her father and family, she had conquered the Olympics and Hollywood. But the world was about to change, and the 26-year-old superstar was soon forced to make the most important decisions of her life. As Hitler and fascism stomped across Europe and her Norwegian homeland was ever more threatened by war, Sonia, in sharp contrast, settled into a comfortable life in the exclusive Holmby Hills section of Beverly Hills. When I first met her, she wanted me to see her trophy room. She had these huge gold trophies, and uh, they were for, from skating championships that she had won all over the world. Some were huge, tall, some were small, some were like plates but they were all gold. Now the financial head of the Henny clan, Sonia added to her personal fortune through franchised ice skating schools, product endorsements, and merchandising opportunities. And like her father, Sonia was not shy about showcasing the rewards of her hard work. She would drive around Hollywood in the most gorgeous white cord car with, with the top down, and she always wore white she knew she looked great in white, so that's why she wore white. And she was spectacular. Famous for her stylish wardrobe and unparalleled collection of diamond jewelry, the dippled star felt at home with the rich and famous of Hollywood. And as the reigning hostess of Beverly Hills, an invitation to one of her extravagant parties became something of a status symbol. She was one of a small group of ladies who uh, delighted you when uh, you were invited to one of their parties. And they were lavish. They were beautiful. Every star in Hollywood would be there that night. Producers and directors, people like Marlene Dietrich and Merle Oberon, Ty Power, who was also at one point in her life very enamored of her, and uh, Clark Gable. Oh, I can go on and on and on. The stars that were there. She had everybody there, all, uh, all the uh, a, a, a group. We call them the A group. But though Henny films still fared well at the box office, Fox was beginning to run out of fresh story ideas for their ice princess. As her highly publicized romance with Tyrone Power ended, Zanuck reteamed the former lovers in second fiddle, hoping that the duo's proven screen chemistry could carry the picture. I know. I'm all confused. Oh, you don't love Willie? You know you don't. And you didn't love Roger, either. You love the man that wrote those notes and those rhymes and that song. You love me, am I right? You can talk a person into more trouble. Second Fiddle was warmly received by the movie-going public, and Henny once again found herself falling for a handsome man. New York socialite Dan Topping was one of the few men who could compete financially with the 27-year-old millionaires. After he hosted several lavish parties for the fiery blonde, Sonia fell madly in love with him. For the first time, she believed she had found a kindred spirit outside her own family, a man with whom she could start her own life. For her next film, Everything Happens at Night, starring with Robert Cummings and Ray Milland, Sonia was paid an impressive $125,000. Unfortunately, critics were not impressed. One reviewer wrote, the refrigerators for keeping Miss Henny on ice seem finally to have collapsed of nervous exhaustion. But poor press would soon be the least of Sonia's worries. By now, Nazi forces were systematically plowing their way through Europe. On April 9, 1940, Hitler stunned the world with the swift invasion of Norway. Sonia's hometown of Oslo fell within 24 hours. Oslo, on a steep and rocky fjord, was strongly situated for defense. But defense was demoralized. There was some fighting, 
but not enough resistance to prevent the Germans from landing and swiftly seizing Oslo, giving the Nazi invaders a strategic advantage in the Norwegian war. Historic events are being shaped by these scenes in Oslo. As news of the Nazi takeover reached her, and with her family home and fortune at stake, Sonia needed to think fast in a desperate effort to protect what assets she could. Most every house in the area, particularly the plush ones like her summer house, were confiscated for use by the Nazi uh, occupiers. She called up uh, her maid who was in charge of the summer house and instructed the maid to pull out all the memorabilia that showed uh, Hitler being favorable to her, including autographed pictures. And those were planted around the house. And the Germans came in, took a look at the pictures, and politely bowed out. It was also at this time that Henny took steps to become an American citizen. And on July 4th, 1940, Sonia and Dan Topping became man and wife. But even marriage couldn't unite the couple's considerable assets. The star's bank accounts would remain her property. And Sonia's business acumen would earn her the nickname Miss U.S. Mint. She catapulted through to this extraordinary level of stardom during the middle of the Depression and was making these scads of money and investing like a, a ferret, you know. I think there was a lot of envy about her. As Sonia's wealth grew, so did increasing criticism. Especially galling were the skating stars' reported refusals to help her homeland in their fight against the Nazis. And they asked Sonia, would you please donate money to this? And Sonia, for several reasons, one is she hated to part with money, and two, uh, she didn't want to lose her German following, said, no, I can't do this. I'm an American now. We're neutral. I can't participate. And that created a big uh, uprest with the rest of the Norwegian population. Determined to maintain her box office status, Sonia pressured Zanuck to pull out all the stops for her next film. Sun Valley Serenade boasted a stellar cast, including John Payne, Milton Berle, Dorothy Dandridge, the Nicholas Brothers, and Glenn Miller and his orchestra. Uh, waitress. Yes, sir. Uh, we'll all have a sauerbrat and a spots and cheesecake and beer. How's that? Sounds terrible. I'll have a steak. And waitress, champagne. Yes, ma'am. Champagne? Whose birthday is it? In Norway, we only have champagne at festivals or a christening or a wedding. Darling, you're psychic. I'm going to let you all in on a little secret. I've accepted Ted's proposal. We're getting married. But the film's lavish budget and generous production schedule did little to soften the star's sharp business sense. As the picture neared completion, she found that she once again had the upper hand over the studio's boss. We were nearly through with the picture, Sun Valley. Everything was going fine up until the last, next to the last day. When her contract finished for that picture, she said, well, that's it. Gee, it's been a wonderful time, and they said, well, what happened? We, we didn't shoot the last scene yet. She said, yes, but I'm through today. Today, I'm through of, of the days that I'm shooting, according to my contract. Well, back came Zanuck down, down to the stage. And he said, you have to finish the picture. She said, I know, but my contract is over for the duration of, of Sun Valley Serenade. Now, this is Sonia. She had a great business brain. She charged him $225,000 for the extra day. What could Zanuck do? Sun Valley Serenade was completed and, as intended, was a huge hit. Even Newsweek magazine enthused, the blonde figure skater impresses for the first time as an actress rather than a specialist, and easily dominates a vehicle that relies less on ice footage than any of her past musicals. <laughs> Unable to ignore Sonia or her success, Zanuck was forced to beg his Nordic nemesis to appear in two more films.
she controlled. I don't want to say she had the whip, but she, she really did. And uh, she knew what she wanted, and she got it. But as Sonia's career was secure, her marriage to Topping was crumbling. It had become apparent that the New York playboy had few financial assets, as well as a roving eye for other women. Dan used to ask her for money frequently. And one time, she was visiting another friend in the Caribbean on a yacht. And so Dan called her on the radio and asked for money. And she was mortified because this was the radio. Anybody could hear it. You know, all the ships at sea could hear the conversation. I remember he was playing around a little bit and flirting. And she didn't like that because she was very much in love with him. She wanted to get even with him because he flirted a little bit too much that night. It was at her home. And after they had finished their dinner, uh, Earl Flynn somehow had taken her into the trophy room. And Earl Flynn proceeded to kiss her. And Dan Topping walked in, and he knocked Earl Flynn clean across the room. He just wham. That was it. In just over a year, Sonia's marriage had fallen apart, and the glamorous life she had dreamed of had become a disappointment. By now, the whole world was at war, and Sonia Henney could no longer hide behind her dimpled smile. After her husband joined the Marines and was shipped overseas, Sonia avoided the subject of her crumbling marriage. She openly dated young Hollywood stars like Van Johnson. And like many celebrities, she contributed to the war effort by visiting service hospitals and selling war bonds. But as her fellow Norwegians still suffered under the Nazi occupation, many were bitter about Sonia's continued lack of support and many could not escape the widely circulated photograph of Sonia shaking hands with Adolf Hitler at a 1934 skating exhibition. You meet somebody like Hitler, that doesn't mean that she was a, one of his people. Uh, he just admired her as an artist. Even today, you know, if somebody like that came up, what can you do? You just say hello. That doesn't mean that you have to sympathize with their ideologies. I don't think she was a political animal. She was a henny an animal. You know, I mean, everything was really in relation to uh, her orbit. Fox, meanwhile, planned two more henny vehicles, Iceland with John Payne and Wintertime, co-starring Jack Oakey. Sonia could be far more than what they had her do on ice. In fact, by the early 40s, she developed a great sense of comedy flair. No, I don't want to work. Not with me and Freddie. Why not? We both too stubborn. I'll show you what I mean. If he came in here right now, he'll say, Hello, Nora. And I'll say, So you finally tore yourself away from that woman. And he'll say, Whatever I do is none of your business. And that will make me mad. And then I'll say, If that's the way you feel about it, you don't have to see me anymore. And he'll say something, and I'll say something, and he'll say something, and that will get me mad. And if I get mad, I lose my temper. And if I lose my temper, I get my head up like this, hey, and I get... Nora. But wintertime would be Sonia's last picture for Fox. World War II was coming to an end. Audience tastes were changing, and the skating star's films now seemed quaint and old-fashioned. After completing nine films in seven years, Sonia was out on her own. In 1945, RKO took a chance on Sonia and cast her in It's a Pleasure. Yes, it's a pleasure that's out of this world. A dazzling symphony of grace and beauty, skill and spectacle, with the queen of the flashing blades, Sonia Henney. But although shot in Technicolor, the film was a box office failure. The pictures that Sonia made, they were entertaining pictures. She skated beautifully. Uh, they didn't have the uh, content that pictures of some of the others, like Dietrich and Garbo and those people had. In 1946, Sonia signed on at Universal to make the Countess of Monte Cristo. It was the kind of glittering confection she'd been famous for. But unlike the Henny of old, the star was increasingly insecure about her popularity and her age. She started quarreling openly with the studio and her director. Sonia wanted to do the skating first, and she didn't want to clutter it up with dialogue. 
you acted when you acted, and you skated when you skated. <laughs> At least that's the way she felt about her skating. Released in 1948, The Countess of Monte Cristo would be Sonia Henney's last film. At 34, she returned to the rink and devoted her time and energy to touring in her ice review. As always, she approached skating with innovation, artistry, and showmanship. She tried to make each of her numbers completely different, the seven numbers that she did in the show every evening. It was her ability to have this diverse character that made her so good. Not only was she this beautiful ice princess, she was an amazing businesswoman. The technology that they use for portable ice skating rinks today, what, that technology was created for Sonia Henney, and it's still the one system that works today. So she really pioneered so much that we still have and that we still use. Divorced from Dan Topping since 1946, Sonia once again fell in love with a man who she believed fit the Henny profile of an acceptable mate. Winnie Gardner Jr. was an East Coast millionaire with leading man good looks and a family pedigree that dated back to the 1600s. The two were married on September 15, 1949, but like her first marriage, Gardner had greater social standing than financial assets. He spent most of his time drinking and meddling in her business affairs. And he claimed that uh, Arthur Wirtz was making all the money and more than Sonia. He would constantly be needling her, you know. Do you know how much money the building made today, Sonia? You know, much more than you did, and things like this. And so he finally convinced her that she should go and produce her own show. Taking her husband's advice, Sonia was determined to produce the shows on her own. After 13 years, the tremendously successful and highly profitable partnership of Wirtz and Henny was dissolved. She didn't know how to book a show, because Wirtz had always done that. She had her brother managing the show for a while, and he got out a road map and put it on the floor of their hotel room, and he decided on where the next town would be, where they'd play, by the size of the dots on the road map. It was a very foolish way to book a show. So her show just kept going down and down, and uh, it was simply because it was badly produced and badly promoted and badly planned. Saddled with another unhappy marriage and burdened with the complete responsibility for her ice shows, Sonia began to drink. It's a tough life, you know. It's traveling and living in hotels and out of suitcases, and, you know, no, you don't really have your family, and you have a few friends. For the first time in her life, Sonia was losing money, and the quality of her shows was slipping. In 1952, at an ice show in Baltimore, the stadium bleachers collapsed during a performance. Hundreds were injured, and Sonia blamed her brother Life for the mishap. Unable to meet the million-dollar bond for her next show in New York, Sonia was forced to cancel, paying off employees and refunding money to ticket holders. Lawsuits escalated, as did the skater's need to escape by drinking. Now 40, and with her film career behind her and her ice shows in trouble, Sonia headed back to Norway for the first time since the war. It was a homecoming she had dreaded, but could no longer avoid. When she finally went back to perform in Norway, on opening night, she was scared to death that uh, they were gonna boo her off the stage. The old recollection came back and said, Sonia, there were things you did in your past that weren't uh, nationalistic or patriotic. Ultimately, time had healed the wounds for most Norwegians and rekindled the pride they felt for their champion. Sonia's show was a tremendous hit and sold out for 30 consecutive nights. But the triumph was short-lived. Exhausted and still drinking heavily, Sonia took the show on the road and was jeered by a Brazilian audience when she fell during a performance. Desperately in need of rest and relaxation, she spent time with old friends. At a dinner party, she sat next to one of her brother Life's former business partners, Niels Onsted and the two struck up a romance. Like Sonia, Onsted was wealthy, stubborn, strong, and passionate. On June 6th, 1956, they were married. 
And for the first time, Sonia had truly found an equal. Niels Anstead was a lovely man, and he was totally devoted to her. And, of course, he was from her country, and uh, I just thought it was an ideal marriage. Among the couple's shared interests was a passion for collecting fine art. Anstead favored abstract art, and his enthusiasm excited Sonia as nothing had since she discovered Hollywood. The couple maintained homes in Holmby Hills, Lausanne, and Norway. They shared their love of art and indulged themselves with a lavish lifestyle. Now and then we would go out for lunch. Then afterward we'd go shopping at Roosters or Lakin's Jewelers, and she would always buy something. She had 10 or 12 incredible diamond necklaces. One of them, I remember, had marquee-shaped diamonds all the way around. With the passing of her mother in 1960 and the estrangement from her brother life, Niels had become Sonia's lifeline. More and more, the couple's time was spent supervising the construction of a magnificent art museum overlooking Oslo's fjord. It would be a home for their priceless collection and all of Sonia's trophies. When the Henny Onstad Art Center opened in August 1958, the gala was attended by the Norwegian royal family and a contingent of famous and titled international friends. But what should have been a great celebration turned into a painful snub when Sonia and Niels were deliberately excluded from an important luncheon in honor of the museum. Wounded and humiliated, Niels and Sonia returned to Los Angeles, where Sonia returned to her first love, skating. But at 56, Sonia was feeling unusually fatigued. After a string of doctor's appointments, Niels was given the terrible news. Sonia was gravely ill. Uh, she invited me out to skate that day at Pickwick, and we did a few of our old routine items. Uh, she was just as spunky as ever, even though by this time she was going down with the leukemia that eventually took her. On October 10th, 1969, on a plane bound for Oslo and with her head resting quietly on her husband's shoulder, Sonia Henny died in her sleep. She was 57 years old. Despite her past difficulties with her fellow Norwegians, her funeral was a regal affair, befitting a much-loved national hero. Bugles, drum rolls, and banks of flowers paid fitting tribute to the woman who had been her country's reigning queen of the ice. In life, Sonia Henney embodied the best of the athletic spirit. Hers was a life lived for fierce competition and enormous success. And if her methods were not always understandable to her critics, her outstanding achievements will certainly stand the test of time. I have the greatest admiration for Sonia. What I think she made the industry. Sonia Henney opened the doors for people such as Peggy Fleming and myself, and there was so much to learn from her in the presentation. True and, and true, a very genuine woman, and she could be very uh, full of uh, sympathy. She took good care of people that came to visit her, but of course she, uh, she could be very vulgar, and uh, also that I liked very much. <laughs> she had the, the language of the streets here in Oslo. Sonia Henny died of leukemia in 1969 at the age of 57 en route to her native Norway. Sonia is many things to many people. Above all, Sonia Henny is one of the finest figure skaters the world has ever seen. An athlete whose artistic grace and flair made her sport the marquee event it is today. A skater whose name is synonymous with perfection. A woman forever blessed with the title Queen of Ice.
I nyhetene fra Tjekoslovakia druknet nesten årets store kulturbegivenhet her hjemme, åpningen av Sonja Hennis og Nils Onstads kunstsenter på Høvikodden i Bærum. Kunstsenteret er en gave fra ekteparet, og bare selve bygget, formet som et kastanjeblad, kostet ca. 30 millioner kroner. I tillegg kommer den verdifulle samlingen av moderne malerkunst, som Sonja Hennis og Nils Onstad har skjenket kunstsenteret. Ingenting er billig på Høvikodden, men så er det også blitt noe helt for seg selv, et senter som har vakt interesse og beundring langt utover Norges grenser. Et imponerende oppbud av kjent folk fulgte åpningen av kunstsenteret. Det er min sted. Det er spangeligheit. Jeg er stolt og glad at min mann Nils og jeg har bygget dette vakre kunstsenteret i Norge. Og jeg håper at alle blir like glad i det som vi er. Jeg klarer jeg. Dette kunstsenter. Sonja Henny, Nils Onstad kunstsenter på Høvikodden i Bærum. Får åpnet til sitt rette bruk. Bare noen dager etter åpningen fikk Høvikodden kongelig besøk igjen, og denne gangen var det kongelige fra hele Europa som ble vist rundt i kunstsenteret. Bryllupsgjester fra mange land kom nemlig til Oslo, noen med tog, som kong Fredrik og dronning Ingrid av Danmark, andre med fly.
Dronninga i norsk skjøytesport, Sonja Henny, dødde i oktober 57 år gammel. Sonja Henny revolusjonerte kunstløpsporten og dannet selv skule på isen. Hun var Noregsmeister, Europameister og Værsmeister flere ganger og tok dessuten tre olympiske gullmedaljer. I 1936 var Sonja Henny profesjonell og var etter det den store stjerna i flere filmer og i egne isjål. Hun ble også kjent for sin sosiale og kulturelle innsats, mellom andre gjennom kunstsenteret på Høvikodden. Sonja Henny ble bisett i Haslum Krematorium i Bærum. Thank <laughs> you. 